Mike, first of all, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's an honor to have you. Oh, it's an here. honor for me to be here. Thank you very much. As I was saying, as I was doing my Portuguese introduction, you were on the most important, probably the most important collaborator Jack Kirby had during the 70s. Uh, Jack Kirby would be 100 years old now if you were alive. Unfortunately, he left us in 1994 when he was 76 years old. Uh, you worked with him during the 70s. Can I touch on his passing in 94? Of course. Okay. Because it was shortly after a massive 6.8 earthquake, which did $80,000 American uh, worth of damage to my house. And he lived in Thousand Oaks, less than 16 miles from me in Simi Valley. And the day that the antique store called us from Thousand Oaks and said, please come get your antique fireplace mantle. It's on the floor under a pile of junk. We come get it. So my son, who was staying with us while we were recovering from the shock of our house being decimated, and I drove by the street that would be the exit, Jams Road, to go down to Sapper where Jack lived. And I told my son, I says, let's go by and say hello to Jack. And then I thought, no, that is rude to drop in on somebody without announcing ahead of time. So I just drove on home, and then less than two weeks later he was gone. And so to this day, I don't worry about whether I should come by someone's house or not. If I have the urge, I stop. So you, you never saw Jack, Jack again after that, right? Uh, no, the, my, my yes. reluctance in uh, being a rude visitor. Uh, so I went home, and then two weeks later he was gone. But tell me, this is not working again. Uh, as far as I know, during the 70s, it was very common for people, for fans, to drop by Jack's house, right? Well, it's funny. In San Diego at the International Comic Con in July, I was on a few panels, but there was a panel that I attended that everyone up on the stage were probably a generation behind me. At least, at least some of them were 20 years younger than me. And they all talked about how, when they were kids, they would look up Jack's name in the phone book, call him up, and Jack would ask them out to the house. So they'd show up with their stacks of comic books they could autograph. Roz, his great wife, would make sandwiches for them. And all of them said, yeah, we all did that. And I had a, an ego moment where I wanted to stand up in the audience and say, but guys, I'm the only guy here that Jack called. It was the opposite. So that was, this is not working. So that was when Jack knew about you and the quality of your work and invited you to work yeah, with him. Yeah, my wife and children were AAU competitive swimmers and they were at workout. And I closed up my studio and I was walking across the backyard of the house, the phone rang in the kitchen I ran and picked it up, hello, and there's this voice that says, Mike Ryer, this is Jack Kirby. Alex Toth says you're a pretty good inker. And then when I picked myself up off the floor, I asked him, what could I do for him? He said he had a piece of art that he would like me to ink. Could I come out to his house the next day? So I did, and fortunately, since I had been working with Russ Manning at this period, I always had a duplicate set of tools in the car shoebox full of pen points, ink, brushes, container to hold water, and that was in the car, and I asked Jack, he showed me the art, and I said, is tomorrow morning good enough? And he said, well, why don't you do it here? And I thought, oh Lord, this is great intimidation. He wants me to sit at his drawing board and ink his pencils. In front of him. With him coming around every <laughs> so often and looking over my shoulder. And so, fortunately, I, I passed this baptism of fire, and I think the main reason Jack wanted to watch me doing it is to make sure that it actually came from my hand. And from that moment on, I was part of the Kirby extended family. So, uh, Jack was doing a lot of pages then, as always, but he was doing, I think, three books a month when he was working for DC Comics, I think 60, 64, Well, at this time, pages. he was still at Marvel. Oh, he was still at Marvel? And what he wanted okay. me to ink was his Marvel Mania artwork that appeared in their mail order catalogs right, and right. so on. And then, it seems like just a short time after that, it might have been months, 
but I got a call from Jack saying he was at LAX and he was leaving for New York City. And he said, something important is going to happen, I can't tell you now, but you are part of it. And then a week later, Maggie Thompson, who published a fanzine about comics, phoned me and she says, what is this about Jack leaving Marvel and going to DC? And I said, I don't know a thing about it. A couple days later, I get a call and it's Jack calling from LAX. He told me that he'd left Marvel, he'd gone to DC, I was supposed to be part of the package, but DC didn't want me because they didn't know who the hell I was and they wanted to control stuff on the East Coast. So now you can go into his several magazines a month and... Yeah, yeah. You, you, you have, you had to, to be as fast as he was, right? And it was, I believe, tremendous difficult to, to ink 60 and more well, pages the, the, every month, right? The funny thing, I had inked other people. I had been assisting Russ Manning. I'd been inking other artists at Gold Key Comics in Los Angeles, and I had penciled and inked my own stuff. But I'd always looked at Jack's printed work at Marvel and thought, why isn't anyone ever really inking Jack? Because they were putting their own personalities into it with their brush or pen or their eraser. And I really wanted to have a chance at it. And I must have had some kind of empathy because when Jack finally convinced them to let me ink and letter the books. That was my next question. And of course, DC said, okay, because they were convinced that I would absolutely flop that I would fail, then they would have control again in New York. And to their chagrin, I didn't fail. I lettered a complete book in two days, inked three pages a day, kept up with him, and I have to honestly say, of all the people that I ever inked, including myself, Jack was the only person that wasn't hard. Now, I'm not being immodest, it was just there was something clicked my love affair with Jack since I was a probably eight or nine year old kid and buying Boys Ranch and, and things on the newsstand, that uh, it, was, it was never hard. It was incredibly time consuming to do what I felt was right by Jack. And of course I added the things that I thought should be there from a ultimate coloring uh, process. I would leave uh, Border, or panels unbordered so that the artwork when it was colored would just jump off the page. Something which frightened the colorists when he went back to Marvel because anytime I would ink something without a border they just put a solid block of color to form the, the square. Just tell me one small thing. Uh, do you know who didn't trust you at DC? Was, was it Carmine Infantino? Do you know? Who? Well I know that there was a, a close relationship between Carmine and Coletta. Okay. And it's also the, the, as I've noticed, the mentality back then was that nothing existed west of the Hudson River as far as talent was concerned. Of course, now they were stuck with the fact that Jack had moved west of the Hudson River. He was almost in the Pacific Ocean. But they, they wanted to control things. I think the editor's mentality was, no matter how good the art might be, they were an editor and it still needed to be fixed. It had to be fixed. In any way, in some way. Uh, just, just a small remark for those of you who don't know. Uh, what Mike was saying is, the way people were inking Jack Kirby, which means uh, inking Jack Kirby's pencil, I mean, is that they always embellished in their own way, in the inker's way, what they was always they were always interpreting Jack's pencil instead of doing Jack's a favor by translating to ink what the pencils effectively were. And Vince Coletta that uh, that Mike Royer mentioned was the first was the first inker that Jack Kirby had at DC Comics in the New Gods and Jimmy Olsen. He was also Jack's inker for most of. Uh, Thor's run in Marvel, and is not is not uh, greatly admired or appreciated as an inker for Jack Kirby today, because he erased a lot of stuff in the background, in, in a way of speeding things up, and uh, he changed a lot of 
faces and the way Jack drew hair and stuff like that. Okay, well, we may Jack, proceed. Jack was a wonderfully political guy when people would ask him while he was producing comic books, who's your favorite inker? And he would say, well, you know, Senate's very good, and Frank Giacoya, and, they, and such and such have their points. But what I'm proud of is the fact that when he left comic books, when he was asked who was his favorite inker, he would say Mike Royer. And that's only because I was just an extension of Jack. He gave me a pencil <coughs> statement, and I completed it. And like I say, it, it was never hard because there was something about growing up, particularly the Simon and Kirby years. I had someone make a comment when I was thinking in the days of the mob number two. They said, wow, this is just, this is pure Simon and Kirby. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know anything else. It's when I inked Russ Manning, you couldn't tell what I had done. It looked like Russ. When I inked Don Heck, it looked like Don Heck had inked it. And all of the people that I met on the West Coast, um, I did an awful lot of inking on a, guys anywhere from, from Doug Wildy to Mel Kiefer to, uh, some of the names escape me, Sparky Moore, Mike Aarons, who you probably don't know, but they were the backbone artists for all the gold key comics done on the West Coast. And these guys were my mentors. And they told me way back then that the most important thing is that an artist got his first job on his ability, and after that, every job was on his dependability. And that's why Coletta did so much work is because he was incredibly dependable. He never missed a deadline and stuff like never that. Never missed right. a deadline. He was the kind of a guy, if, a, if he got a book on Friday and it was due on Wednesday, he had it in Tuesday afternoon. Now that you mentioned never missing a deadline, I also believe Jack never missed a deadline, for sure. No, I, uh, let me segue. There is a Conan the Barbarian called, I think it's called what, The Ballad of Red Sonia. Mm -hmm. It's an early number. And Jack called me and says, I'm working on developing this new stuff, so Marvel's going to send you some other material. And they sent me um, Barry Smith Conan. And I, the first page I picked the ink had a scantily clad red Sonia on it, so I had to do that one first. And I defy any of you to look at that book and find the page I inked. Oh, I gave it away, didn't I? But uh, I, as an inker, I had no personality. I tried to be who, the personality of the... Who was the inker the in the book? Was it really Barry Smith? Hmm? The inker on that book was Barry Smith It was himself? finished by Barry Smith okay. because Jack called me and he says, send it back. I'm ready for you. And of course, Smith was upset because he only penciled it that tight because he wasn't going to ink it himself. But uh, I tried to adopt the personality of whoever I was inking. And um, I don't think any of you can tell what I did when I was doing the comic books with Russ Manning, because I thought that's what an assistant was supposed to do, be invisible. And as I said, there's been many pencilers that I did not like inking, including myself. Once I'd penciled it, I didn't want to ink it. Uh, and tell me, uh, during the 70s, certainly you had many opportunities to speak with, uh, with Jack, uh, to be with Jack. Well, with, with Jack, a lot of people ask me what I call nuts and bolt questions. And I don't remember that. What I remember is sitting in the kitchen at the Kirby house, sitting at the kitchen table, eating Roz's homemade chocolate cake and drinking a glass of milk and talking about the Warner Brothers movies that Jack and I liked. That was the kind of conversations we had. There were times that Jack and I would be sitting at his drawing board and he's, I had delivered the book in person this time rather than sending it in the mail. And while we're going over the finished pages, my kids are swimming in his pool and my wife is in another room visiting with Roz. It was really like extended family. The Kirby's were, Jack was one of the most creative human beings I've ever met in my life and we will never, ever have anyone like him again. But they were just incredibly warm, right? Warm. Hell, Ross, if you've seen the documentary on the third pressing of the first Fantastic Four movie that has the documentary about Jack Kirby, storyteller, I, I rewatched it recently and I'm, I'm the only guy on the DVD that swears. Did they put a beep on it? No, no, they left it in. Okay, my my comment was, 
for those of who, you who may think that Roz was like in the background and was secondary to Jack, I said, that's bullshit. It wasn't. Jack was the creator he was because Roz was there. She made sure that there were things taken care of. Jack was such a creator that you couldn't drive anywhere or go anywhere with Jack if he was driving. He wouldn't wind up there. She drove because Jack was always creating. I mean, Jack... He lost touch with reality sometimes, well, right? Well, it was in his own reality. There, were, there was one instance... In many realities, probably. Well, there was one instance where in one of his books that I actually added a narrative panel. Added yeah, what, I'm sorry? Uh, I added some narration like... Oh, okay, 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 narrative, okay. You know, the printed text above the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I had met with him, I was working full-time at Disney, and he wanted to know if I had time to do Silver Star for him. And I said, I, I should have time thinking he was talking about one issue. And we sat at lunch, and he described the story, and I'm thinking, my God, this is all in one issue? No, he had all six, six issues. issues done in his head. And when I got the first issue, I was thinking and lettering, or I was lettering a page, and suddenly it, it wasn't clear to me. So I wrote a narrative box to explain something, because I realized that Jack and Roz knew it so well, and she was his editor, in essence. When he sat down and drew it, he knew the story so well, he didn't realize he'd left out something that would have said like, meanwhile, or little did they know, or whatever. Because the only kind of editor Jack needed was somebody to read and say, uh, why did they do that? Because Jack knew why they did it. I think that raised when and where he was, the mean streets of New York City, um, deciding he didn't want to be part of the street gangs, he wanted to draw, learning to draw early, getting into all kinds of things, trying everything under the sun. And this is a guy that fought in the trenches in World War II, saw his buddies annihilated next to him, who experienced all of that. And when he came out of it and went back in, into comic books, he had all of this life experience that he could twist and mold, turn any way he wanted to create these incredible stories that many of us now read years after buying them and realizing how much deeper these stories were than the first times we read them. I, I see that all the time on, on Facebook. Somebody says, I just reread such and such, and my God, that was so much better than I remember it when I read it as a kid. Yeah, what is That's why I say there'll never be anybody like him. What is noticeable is most of his most important villains, like Doctor Doom, uh, like Darkseid, they're sort of like a, a Hitler sort. Well, and also they are the they're the personification of evil. They're they're representing fictional characters oppression that, that encompasses yes the oppression and all of that, and it's. It's the, it's the impression I originally had of Darth Vader. I said the way you would destroy Darth Vader is not believe in him anymore. And who inspired Darth Vader? Jack Kirby. Yeah. The father-son relationship? Yeah. Like with Orion and Darkseid. It's quite obvious, right? And, uh, as I said, you, you dealt... You dealt... A, ah, that's much better. You dealt a lot with Jack. What did he think about that, for, ex for instance, Star Wars, the inspiration they took from him? By that time, 77, um, you know, I don't think we ever talked about it. <laughs> I don't even think that Jack really even thought about it until fans would bring it up. Or other people would say, well, obviously, Lucas stole it from this and so on. I, I think that Jack was always on the next project, on the next book, the next character. It's one of the reasons that I believe he never noticed until Steve Sherman and Mark Evanair pointed it out to him, everything that Vinny was leaving out and changing in the books he was inking. Because once Jack had penciled it and sent it off, he would glance at the printed book, but the story was all up here anyway. So he wasn't looking at the fine details. I don't know, I may sound like I'm one of the heads of his fan club, <laughs> but uh, I just think it's 
Jack as a human being was incredible. I mean, there was never a nicer guy that I worked with, nobody nicer than Jack Kirby, nobody that, in essence, after that first meeting with him, made you feel like you were part of the family. You know, sitting in the kitchen eating Roz's homemade sandwiches while you're taking a break from the inking and you get to meet the kids and, you know. And that, that is something absolutely unthinkable today with stars today. Well, the, I don't think there's even phone books any longer, right? But well, I, I think that Jack, well, I worked with two artists that I believe had very strong egos and opinions about what they were doing but it wasn't overt and that was Russ Manning I, I firmly believe he felt that what he was doing was the right way to do it and Jack Kirby felt that what he was doing was the way to do it and I sat between them once at a weekend convention in Los Angeles which was a kick in the pants because the thing that I learned most from both of those artists was what I call real storytelling we all know that you start this panel and go to this panel and down the page but when i say storytelling it's what i learned from from working with russ and jack particularly jack is that the artist who's a good storyteller will make you go exactly where he wants you to go in the next panel and throw you down here so you see this first in the next panel that's storytelling and jack was a master and I don't think he would, he would have ever run out of ideas, ever. Well, uh, after he, he, he basically left comics, he started working for the animation industry, developing lots of ideas, most of them have never seen the light of day, but I don't know. We, we've all seen those model sheets for all those different characters. Exactly. He was constantly creating. I think maybe only Thunder the Barbarian was the, the most well known and most developed of those concepts he did. And he probably put Doug Wilde's nose out of the joint because until Jack started doing that stuff, Doug was doing all that. <laughs> but do you think, I'll put it out of the way, how do you think Jack dealt with his less successful comics, at least, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say critically wise, but his less successful comics from the late 70s with Marvel, for example when some people start and started to say that Jack had lost it. Oh, well, I... Why? I was, at a, I was on a panel at International Comic Con one year where I was booed by the audience. Jesus. Now, before all of us went out on stage, I talked to John Buscema and several other people, and I said, you know, to me it's so obvious that the guys at Marvel Comics are stacking the letter pages. Every letter talks about how great the writing is, but the drawing sucks. Every letter. And that's because everybody at Marvel wanted to fix Jack. So let's make him look bad. And I mentioned, they said, yeah, you're absolutely right. We went on stage, and I got up there and said, the problem is, is that Marvel is filled with a whole bunch of fanboys that want to fix Jack, and they're stacking the letter columns. And not one person on the stage would go, you're right, Mike. It was all like, oh, really? You think that, Mike? And who was that? I, I can't remember. Oh, it was no one... Uh, well, it was no one actually said those words, but the whole okay. look like was, what are you talking about, Mike? Why would they stack the letter pages? But why do you think Marvel did that to Jack? Because Jack changed, Marvel changed a lot too. I think it's because Jack, Jack himself was the house of ideas. <laughs> and everyone wanted to fix Jack. They'd like to correct his dialogue. They'd like to fix his artwork. So then they could say, I fixed Jack Kirby. So it was all... I don't know, do you agree with me, Rand? Yeah. It was all a matter of ego then. You know, it was just a bunch of... As of I the young it, editors. As I called it, I don't know how I refer to the, the uh, incestuous fanboys that produced Marvel Comics. In the 70s, especially. <laughs> We won't name anybody, but I think everybody knows we're talking about. Well, I, I'm outspoken. You can, you I'm can, outspoken you can sometimes. Do you well, can do it. Well, now I say, so I can say what I want. What are they going to do? Not give me work? They've not given me work for decades. <laughs> Let's talk about your later work after Jack Kirby. Well, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, 
I got to a point working with Jack that I wanted to stretch other muscles, and Jack understood that. So it was not a, a acrimonious parting of the ways. We were still extended family, and I accepted an offer from Russ Manning to take over totally all of his inking on the Tarzan Sunday strip, inking and lettering, and the ink and letter of the Star Wars daily and Sunday strip. And after about 16 weeks, I just walked away from Russ because I never got the body of work I was supposed to get each week, depending on what I needed as income. And I found out that he was telling the Lucas people that the reason he was late was his assistant's fault. And of course, I would show up at Russ's to pick up work and he'd be off fishing with his son. And so I thought, you know, I don't need this. And Sparky Moore, who was one of my mentors, he was in the 50s, drew things like Rin Jan Chin and Lassie and all kinds of things at Gold Key. He called me and he says, you know, they're looking for somebody at Disney to do freelance on their foreign comic strips. So I went out with some samples, took home some work, and for two or three weeks, did some freelance work for Disney. And one day, the art director of the department called and said, would you like to come in and talk about your future? So I went in and he said, how would you like to come on staff? And as they would say in old uh, hard-nosed detective radio shows, in less time than it takes to tell, in which year I said yes. In which year did that happen? That was uh, uh, early 79. So I went to work on staff at Disney and for 21 and a half years created product and drew all the Disney characters and probably 80% of people that know my work only know me as inking and lettering Jack Kirby. But I did some of the best artwork I ever did in my life with the funny animals because every drawing I did, Jack was looking over my shoulder. So everything I drew was it was just one drawing with one character, or if it was eight characters, it was one frame from a story. It wasn't a pinup, it was a frame from a story. And, and so all the time I was drawing those mice and ducks and tiggers and poo bears, it was, Jack was looking over my shoulder. I learned not to be afraid of a blank piece of paper from Jack Kirby. I think that's probably the great impact he had in everybody's life who dealt, especially people who dealt with him. Well, he didn't want anyone that asked for advice and would show him their work. He didn't want anyone to imitate him. He wanted them to find their own voice. But I think to think like he did as a storyteller, to make your point. And there are a handful of us that, that took that advice, and I like to think if I had any success at Disney, he was in the he was in the back room. I remember reading, um, probably in some Jack Kirby magazine, an interview with Jack Kirby, when he mentioned a time when a kid came to him, looking, uh, showing him drawings that looked like Jack Kirby, and he said, "No, kid, you're doing it wrong. You don't you don't look like me. Have your own style." I think it was probably the most important message yeah. he had for the, for those who who came to him, right? Well, do, do that your, inspiration. Do your own thing. Yeah. Be but, yourself. But do it with some, some uh, education behind what you're doing. Not necessarily book learning, as I said when I was a kid, but observing who your idols, uh, how they work, what they do. I mean, we, those of us who draw and drew professionally, uh, we all learn certain things from our icons. Every ear I ever drew and inked was a Russ Manning ear a la Alex Raymond. You know, uh, there are things you learn, you perfect. I remember once going out to Russ's with a pile of Stan Drake, Julia Jones daily originals, and he studied them for hours, the way Stan inked lips on his women. You know, we all learn from everybody else, but the thing is to learn. And yes, I did an Alex Raymond ear, but if you put my ear next to Alex, it's like, this is an Alex Raymond ear? But no, it came from Raymond through Russ Manning and then yeah. by me. And it's, it's, I guess it's what Re Russ used to say is the difference between an illustrator and a cartoonist. As cartoonists, we have these formulas. There are certain ways we draw ears. An illustrator, if he's painting, everybody's gonna have a different ear. It's gonna be their ear. 
if I'm making any sense, and usually I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yesterday we were we were seeing the exhibition, the Kirby exhibition, and you were you had somewhat of a nostalgic nostalgia in your eye when you said uh, something like it's a pity Jack didn't have the didn't have this the fame oh, he yeah. deserved when he was alive. I thought Jack could see all this, you know? But he predicted all of this when he said sometime in the future these characters I created will be popular icons in all the world as you can we can all see now in the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the, in and, I will, the DC. and I will be on my soapbox forever saying that Jack Kirby created the Marvel Universe. Not, not the snake oil salesman that takes credit. <laughs> all right. Yeah, who shows up in Those opinions movie. are only those of the person being interviewed and not necessarily those <laughs> of the <laughs> festival and its organizers. Okay, so you so you you also think that Stanley took most of the of the credits for well, something I he didn't do? Well, I think one of the one of the things behind Stan taking credit for everything has to do with cementing a publisher's claim that they own stuff, and if they can show that a person and their employee wrote everything and co-created everything, then that's some heavy ammunition when someone says, "No, that's mine." And it's like, no, look at this. Well, when I was a kid and would pick up the Atlas comic books and every story, no matter what the style was, was signed by Jack Kirby. I mean, I'm sorry, signed by Stan Lee. My feeling was, this guy is an incredibly versatile or there's some hanky-panky going. <laughs> and I like Stan. I cracked, I cracked him up once at a luncheon. We sat down at, I hope you don't mind me telling these stories, we sat down at this little round table at an ACPA luncheon, luncheon in New York City. ACPA, that's the, uh, quick somebody, uh, Association of Cartoonists of America, whatever. Anyway, it was some organization, <coughs> and it was in New York City, and I'd just been talking to John and Ramita about what size brush you ink with. And I was flabbergasted when he said, Winsor Newton Series 7, number 4. Then Stan and this statuesque gorgeous blonde walks in on his arm and the three of us sat down at the table me stan the blonde she's wearing glasses i looked across the table at her and i said could could you take those glasses off she went okay she took the glasses off and i went my god you're beautiful <laughs> went right over her head but it cracked stan up so folks, I made Stan laugh, and not at my work. I believe sometime later he did that. He did that joke and said, "I invented it." <laughs> uh, well, when I worked on Marvel Superheroes at that small animation studio, Grant Frey Lawrence, Stan came up and visited us at the studio one day, and he was saying things like, "If Alex Raymond walked into my office, I wouldn't give him work." And I thought, oh, okay. Anybody remember, anybody old enough here or uh, have access to the old Marvel superhero shows? Yes. Captain America throws his my hand. Yes, of course. Well, I was the only guy at the studio that had ever read a Marvel comic book. And most of the work I did was on the Submariner episodes, because at that time I think there had only been two of the Tales to Astonish, or whatever it was, Tales to Astonish. that had Hulk and Submariner, Submariner, or Submariner stories in them. Yeah. So we wrote a whole bunch of new Submariner stories. And guys like Doug Wildey and Mel Kiefer and uh, Herb Hazleton and Mike Ahrens and, and Nikita Nats and me were drawing new material. And so the best artwork that you'll find in any of those cartoons will be in the Submariner stories. Well, the other was reused from the comics, it was, right? It was stats from the original yeah. art with extended with the art. Bamps and we would extend stuff and to fill in between panels. I remember one of the first things I drew was Tony Stark in the cockpit of his, of his jet plane, you know. And I think somebody else even inked it. But uh, it was an interesting place to work. And when they went into hiatus after they produced all the shows, I started uh, 
working, doing more work for Gold Key Comics because they wanted more work from Russ Manning. And he said, the only way I can give you more work is if Mike helps me, but Mike needs to make a living. So they called me and said, would you like to come in and pick up work? So my whole career is being in the right place at the right time, just being lucky. But they, uh, after a few months, I got a call from the animation studio and they'd gotten the deal to do the Saturday morning Amazing Spider-Man cartoons. And I went in and met their new production manager, and this will show you how clever they were at Grand Trey Lawrence. He came from the construction trade, and he's now the production manager in an animation studio. And he asked me if I'd like to come back to work, and I said, I can only give you 20 hours a week because of all the stuff I'm doing with Russ and Gold Key, etc. He said, if you only do 20 hours a week, I cannot give you screen credit. Dumb me, 20-something. I could have gone to the screen cartoonist union, just mentioned that, and they would have jumped all over him, and my name would have been on those Spider-Man shows, which I laid out over one-third of those 20 episodes. It's those classic Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever Spider can. Yeah, it's that's that one? the show. Everybody and, knows And that. the director I worked directly with, the third week that I came in with my work, my layouts for the scenes, he said, Mike, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He says, everybody in-house is madder than hell at you. I said, why? Because the work you're turning in and charging me 20 hours for is more than they're doing in-house in 40. <laughs> so I said, what do I do? He says, bill me for 40. <laughs> So I worked 20 hours a week and build them for 40. <laughs> Twice as good. That's a good story to come out of TV animation. Definitely. Well, we have about seven minutes. So Do we have seven minutes worth of questions? Exactly. You're experienced in this. The clock is ticking. Well, uh, Michelle wants to ask you a question. <laughs> what what book of the 70s are you working on the most? Repeat the question. I think it was... Which book in the 70s did you enjoy doing the most? Was that? Thank you. Probably Demon. I don't know why, but I just... Yeah. You know, and that's the book that so many people say, Coletta should have inked that. He would have been better for Demon than Royer. No. Oh, can I say one more thing about Spider-Man? Of course. It's Spider How close I came to being the voice of Peter Parker <laughs> in Spider-Man? Grant Race, or Grant Simmons of Grant Ray Lawrence wanted me to do the voice of Spider-Man. And he lobbied hard for it. But Lawrence, the producer in New York, wanted to use non-union Trillium in Canada. So that's how I lost out being Peter Parker and Spider-Man on television. But was that common for artists to do the voices too? For no, that, wasn't, to a, do the that voice? wasn't a common thing, but he... I thought you know. were maybe, okay. maybe he just spent too many years in the business because he and then he thought I would be good at it. I don't know. But again, I was the only guy at the studio who had ever read a Marvel comic book. And the reason Grant Ray Lawrence went bankrupt is that Ray Ray Patterson of Grant Ray's wife was in charge of the story department, and she had five writers. And every week she would have all five writers. Right, their version of, from the same synopsis. And amazingly, they went bankrupt. <laughs> How does that figure? <laughs> you know, every, every week, two episodes in the Spider-Man show, except for one that was a complete story. I laid that whole episode out with Rhino and Electro and, you know, anyway. All right. But amazingly, and this is how dumb I was in my 20s. Grant Simmons called me is that your recording device? That is my recording device. at least. Grant Simmons called me on a Friday and he says, bring your car in tomorrow and make, and make sure the trunk is empty. And I said, why? He says, the sheriff is closing this down Monday and you can take home anything you want. <laughs> so, did I take home all those stacks of colored cells? No. Did I take the stacks of pencil animation? No. I took the one page of Jack Kirby artwork from a Western comic book and a George Tusk of Captain America, and I thought, this is great. I'd be a rich man now if I'd taken all that stuff home. <laughs> and if you kept your pages, I didn't the pages even, you inked. I didn't even take anything I had done. Because I thought, 
Who wants this crap? Just about everybody. Any more questions? Yep. Were you aware at all about the, the same situation that led to the early demise of the fourth world titles? Well, I was, you know, I was, uh, I was the laborer who was working in the trenches. You know, when I talk about my career in comic books, I was this little cog in this huge monstrous wheel that produced comic books. And I was so close to the, the work on the board and getting it done that there wasn't really much that I knew about what was going on. It's just that things, what I was getting from Jack was, was changing, but I didn't know about all the back, the politics in the background. And I don't think Jack was the kind of guy that felt that, that I needed to know all that stuff. Because I worked for Jack Kirby. The checks came from DC and Marvel, but I worked for Jack. And uh, there, are, there are other people that inked Jack, but there's only three of us that Jack, that worked directly with Jack. And that's Mike Thibodeau and D. Bruce Berry. Theakston doesn't count. You, you said you worked as a Russ Manning's assistant and then went to Jack Kirby to work as an inker. Haven't you thought at the time to draw your own uh, comic strip or draw? I didn't have a lot of time and the stuff that I did draw was for uh, the Hanna-Barbera superhero comic books, the Hanna-Barbera high adventure comic books. I drew stuff like Mighty Mitor and the Three Musketeers and stuff that I've forgotten. And uh, as a kid, I wanted, to, I wanted to draw Flash Gordon. I wanted to draw Tarzan. I wanted to draw the adventure stuff. And then I found out in, at some time in 1979 that my, my bag was Bigfoot. Funny animals. <laughs> and I had so much fun working on the, with the Disney characters. I retooled, retooled the look of all the Winnie the Pooh characters in late 1993, and in 94 they were opened up for worldwide uh, licensing. Sears' 30-year exclusive contract was done, and the stylization that I came up with for all the merchandise, which I called finished animation rough, in a year and a half was outselling Mickey Mouse worldwide. And if you want to see what that style was like, I brought some of it with me. Not here, but somewhere. All right. Over drinks or dinner tonight or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or out in the hall. Oh, that's... Well... Uh, I want to I wanna thank this man. Oh, please. I thank you. For lobbying me to be here. This has been such a fantastic I just, experience. I just invited you and it's great for you to I have met. I've met so many wonderful people here that I'm asking myself, why didn't I come here 30 years ago? I don't know if I can really, really answer that But I question. wouldn't be surprised if well, there was one no way or another I come back again. I hope so. There was no festival 30 years ago, only 28 years ago, but... Well, 30, 32 years ago, I had this cockamamie idea. If I wrote a letter to all the European cartoonists whose work I admired and said, look, I want to come to Europe. Will you put me up for a couple of days? I'll stay with you, I'll help you with your work, then I'll go stay a couple of days with another cartoonist and help them with the work. I'll pay for my keep, would you be idea. interested? And then I thought, you know, this is awfully egotistical for me to think this, so I just threw the idea away. And then at some time later at Roy Thomas' second wedding at the, the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles, I was talking to a French writer and he said, you idiot, you should have done that. They would have all said yes. Definitely. Now, if I'd done that, I might never have gone back. Well, thank you, Mike. We are now going to do a guided tour to Kirby's exhibition. Me, Mike, and I hope all of you, please congratulate Mr. Mike Royer. <laughs> I have to tell you, I find this art, all this exhibit of Jack's art, very illuminating because between my ears, I'm only 30, 
and I'm looking at work that I did over 40 years ago. I'm having trouble with the math. Definitely.